Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we are going to be talking about how to compress everything. Every single instrument, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version, as concisely as I can. We're going to talk about drums, we're going to talk about bass, we're going to talk about vocals, we're going to talk about guitars, we're going to talk about pianos and keyboards, all sorts of stuff. This is in honor of a new course that I've just put out called Compression Breakthroughs, which is close to 10 hours. It's all about compression. It goes from learning to really hear compression and understand the controls on the compressor, and there's master classes on compressing every single instrument, as well as deep dives into all sorts of advanced compression techniques. But if you don't want to try it, I got a whole bunch of free stuff for you today. This is super concise Cliff Notes, how to compress everything. To make it free and super concise, this is a podcast, so the only thing we got to do to get there is give a super brief shout out to our sponsors. Big thanks to the most important sponsor on this podcast, which is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? With your likes. Also remember to hit subscribe, hit the notifications bell if you're on the YouTube version, or consider giving us a rating and review if you're on one of the audio-only podcast versions. Last little quick shout out to our brand sponsors before we get into the meat of this episode, Isotope, sponsoring the podcast this month. They make some of my favorite tools, and I use at least some of them, practically every master that I do. Check them out over at isotope.com slash sonicscoop, where you can get 10% off of anything they make with the discount code sonicscoop10. Or at that same link, you can get a 30-day free trial to their Music Production Suite Pro Bundle instead of the normal 7-day free trial. Last but not least, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys sponsoring this podcast from the beginning, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. All right, let's get right into the meat of today's episode. First instrument we're going to talk about is drums. And drums is an interesting instrument because... In modern music production, drums are often really heavily processed, and there might be a significant amount of dynamic control going on. But drums are also tricky because they can be one of the hardest instruments to compress, because they're most likely, out of almost any instrument, for you to really hear the artifacts and side effects of compression pretty quickly. This is especially the case with cymbals on live recorded drums. And if you go in and start compressing individual drums that don't have cymbals on there, you're compressing a close mic snare drum or a kick drum, something like that, well, all that compression or limiting you're applying is going to bring up all the cymbal and other bleed in your close mics. So what do you do when it comes to compressing drums? Well, there's a few strategies here. One is the minimalist approach to compressing drums. And that's just what it sounds like. You don't compress them a lot. If you're going to compress them with this minimalist approach, you would maybe do a little bit of bus compression. Often you're going to be steering towards faster attack time so that when you compress them, you're not bringing out the impact of the cymbals too much. Although if a drum kit sounds a little bit dull and it needs more articulation, maybe you're going towards slower attack times. You could also just compress some individual elements. Some people will use kind of slightly faster attack compression on things like overheads just to smooth out the initial impact, initial articulation of those cymbals a little bit. You might use a fast release, but you've got to be careful with faster releases on drums because fast releases bring up your sustain and that can really bring up some kind of cymbal wash and you can start to hear artifacts pretty quickly. So you've got to be careful always when compressing cymbals unless you're really trying to hear the effect of compression. Totally valid thing to do. We go into a lot of detail on that in the course, but that's not for today. All right. The other thing you could do with minimalist compression is, you know, just compress some of your close mics a little bit. But that's the boring stuff. The exciting, interesting stuff is how do we compress drums more <laughs> without making them sound terrible? So, one option is you just do crazy hyper compression on drums and hope that it sounds awesome. And some mixes, it could. But more commonly, you're going to want to apply some significant dynamic control, maybe get some of the tone of a compressor, but without making it like super in your face, obviously overcompressed. This is where the more advanced techniques come in. And the biggest one here, our strategy number two, is parallel compression. I've talked about this so many times on this channel, so I'm just going to keep it super brief. With parallel compression on drums, you might apply it to the full drum bus. That's a really popular approach. You could also apply parallel compression, however, to individual close mics like kick and snare. And the two big rules with parallel compression on drums is you're generally going to use really fast attack times and a lot of compression, and you're usually going to do some compensating EQ. 
The idea behind using a really fast attack time is on your heavily compressed tracks, you're trying to really even out those transients, make them really stable. And then you're just folding in a little bit of this heavily compressed parallel tracks underneath your main tracks. And you could be folding these in at, you know, 10 or 20 dB lower than your main uncompressed tracks. We're just adding some stability, some girth, some fatness, some tones, and some dynamic control, most importantly, with these parallel compressed tracks. But you'll find if you start going and compressing things like crazy and doing, you know, the 10 plus 20 maybe dB of compression that you might do on parallel compressed tracks, things start to get a little mid-rangey, a little honky, a little closed in. And if you're folding in these parallel compressed tracks, you could just be adding mid-range to the drums, which isn't necessarily going to make things sound a lot more impressive and a lot more impactful. So often compensating with significant doses of EQ, big boost in the lows, big boost in the highs, maybe cuts in the mids, that's something that is very often done on parallel compressed tracks. And this is a general approach you can also take with close mics. You'll EQ a parallel compressed snare or kick differently than you would EQ parallel compressed drum bus, but the same overall concept applies. For those of you who have heard that like you shouldn't EQ in parallel because of phase shift, that is like a way overstated problem that I don't have time to go into today's episode. But suffice it to say, as long as you avoid dealing with really, really steep slopes on things like low cut filters, you'll be fine. It's really a non-issue. All right. Approach number three to compressing drums is going to be multiband compression. This is another way you can get more compression without too many artifacts in drums. And if you apply multiband compression to your drum bus, it allows you to do something interesting. You can just target compressing your, say, lows and low mids on the kit, leaving your high frequencies more or less uncompressed. Those areas, and the cymbals, the highs, the upper mid-range, the place where you're going to hear the most artifacts, you can barely touch those, if at all, with your multiband compressor and just focus a little compression on things like kick or maybe just kind of smoothing out the low mids a little bit. Now, that's not the only way to use multiband compression on drums. We go into a lot more detail in the chorus and all that, but one other thing I'll tell you is that potentially you actually might want to compress your high frequencies and use one of the bands in a multiband compressor or dynamic EQ, a little bit like a de where you're using really fast attack times, looking to kind of smooth out some areas that are just speaking too much in things like cymbals. If you're getting too much stick attack on a ride cymbal or a hi-hat, you can use multiband compression to try to target that. You could also take a different approach to multiband compression where you're just specifically trying to target your kick drum and your snare drum, and you're trying to just compress those, or using it just to compress cymbals, or using it just to compress toms on the sides. But all that stuff is a little bit more advanced, but I hope throwing some of these ideas out to you is useful. Those are the three basic ways to approach getting a lot of dynamic control and tone out of drums, but there's kind of a, arguably a fourth one. And for this, I got to let you in on a little secret. And that secret is that most modern drum sounds and like big pop and rock and metal records, not to mention hip hop and EDM, use samples. And it's really easy to get lots of dynamic control out of using samples. And you can compress the heck out of samples without having to worry quite so much about negative unwanted artifacts. You can just get the artifacts and side effects that you want out of compression. But even more importantly, if you're using sample support, sample enhancement, you don't necessarily have to do as much compression because it's kind of dynamically controlled already. And you can just pick a sample with the right tone instead of using a compressor to try to get the tone that you want. So we can't forget about that. Even though it's not technically compression, I still kind of have to throw it in there. All right, next big topic is compressing bass. Bass is another one of these tricky ones where often bass is going to be one of those instruments that's the most compressed out of any instrument in a lot of mixes. Now, Before I go a little bit further, I just want to specify one thing about both drums and bass. If you're dealing with electronic music or hip-hop or EDM or stuff that's really heavily sample-based and virtual instrument-based, 
compression isn't that big of a thing necessarily on individual instruments because it's easy to get dynamic control and easy to get the tone that you want by just using sample selection, instrument selection, and programming in your dynamics that way. But on a real live played bass, real live played drums, these are some of the potentially most dynamic elements that want to be the least dynamic in most modern styles of production. And not just super modern, but going back decades, these things are generally pretty well controlled in a lot of final mixes. So what are the problems potentially with compressing bass and how do you get around them? Okay, well, the minimalist approach to compressing bass is you just pick one compressor and you use that on your bass. Often to get the dynamic control that you want, you're probably going to steer towards faster attack compressors if it's a really dynamically inconsistent bass with a lot of some notes kind of really popping out and kind of blooming more than others. Fast attack compression will tend to give you more dynamic control than slower attack compression. But there's a trade-off here. If you're using a lot of fast attack compression, you can end up kind of dulling sounds out a little bit and sucking some of the life out of them. There are cases in which you will find basses that are already pretty consistently well-performed, and you can use slower attack compressors on them that are really compressing more of the average of the signal. The potential problem with using these slower attack averaging compressors is that they let some of the peaks get through and they might not give you all the dynamic control that you need. So if you're using that kind of approach, it's not uncommon to follow up with a limiter that's going to catch some of those peaks, something that's doing a lot of really fast attack compression occasionally. So this starts to hint at one of our really common approaches when we need to apply more compression, which is serial compression, stacking compressors. We'll talk more about that when we get to vocals. But right now on bass, that's the minimalist thing. One of the big problems you run into when compressing bass, potentially, is that some of the low notes might really blossom more than others. And the low frequencies, which might be so intense in the bass, might be the only thing triggering your compressor or limiter. And the high frequencies are barely getting compressed at all. And the mid-range frequencies are barely getting compressed at all. And the compression that you're trying to apply to make things more even, it might not be making the bass as even as you need or want it to be in the mix. So this brings us to item number two on compressing bass, which is, again, parallel compression. Parallel processing. But in this context, it's pretty different than the approach on drums. The approach on drums is usually to take a full bandwidth, you know, drum bus or single drum instrument and another full bandwidth one, compress one of them a lot, you pressing this duplicate heavily and then folding it in underneath. With bass, it's very different. The way parallel processing is usually used is you split the bass in two and you put an EQ on each, filtering all the low frequencies out of one and all the high frequencies out of the other. So now you have a low bass and a high bass, and you're going to compress those two separately. Some people will go a little one step further than that, and they'll end up with three duplicates of their bass, or I guess that's a triplicate, and you'll have a low bass and mid bass and a high bass. But let's keep it simple for right now. Low bass and high bass. That often works really well. And you want to compress those two separately. Which one do you compress more? Which one do you compress less? How do you treat them differently? Well, I'd say more often than not, the most common way a lot of people employ this technique is by applying lots of compression to the low frequency bass and a little less compression to the mids and high frequencies. So you can get really stable low frequencies that aren't jumping around a lot. And then your mids and highs, you're not totally taking away all their dynamics, all their attack, all their articulation with too much compression on those. And that's one approach. It's a good place to start. Works a lot of the time. Can help make basses sound a lot tighter. But the opposite can also work too. Especially on basses that are really well-performed already and pretty well dynamically controlled just coming out of the player's fingers, I find that the opposite can be a really fun approach. And when you are compressing the high frequencies more and the low frequencies a little bit less, you get a slightly different effect. Usually, generally speaking, all else being equal, the bass sound will veer towards going a little bit more tubby 
in a way that can actually really work and really be fun. If you're doing a lot of fast attack compression on the mids and the highs, really softening out their attack, it gives you a feel that's almost a little bit more retro, a little more old school, a little reminiscent of using flat wound strings instead of round wound strings on a bass. So this is also a totally valid approach. Both are usable and both have different strengths and weaknesses. But one of the other great things about splitting your bass like this in parallel is you can take the mid-high bass, the higher frequency elements of the bass, and send those and just those to effects. So you could add saturation, distortion, chorus, flanger, even reverb or delay to your bass. And since you're adding it just to the mid and or high frequencies, you're not cluttering up the low end with a bunch of reverb on your super low frequencies and subs or a bunch of chorus or a bunch of distortion in those lows that really can't handle it without cluttering up and muddying up the mix. So that's one of the awesome reasons why compressing bass in parallel is a super classic strategy that's loved all the world over to this day. Now, there's one more major approach to compressing bass, and it's so similar to the last one we just discussed, and that's using multi-band compression on the bass. You can do the exact same things that we just talked about with splitting the bass just by using a multi-band compressor. You could compress your lows separately from your mids and highs. You could compress your lows a lot more to get a tighter bass sound that has an even more stable floor. Or you can compress your upper mids more to get a kind of slightly more muted sound, a slightly tubbier sound in a cool way. Either of these approaches are totally cool. You can do it with more bands. You can do it with four or six bands if you want. The one drawback to multiband compression compared to parallel splitting the bass is that with multiband compression, you're generally not going to be able to take your mid and upper frequencies and send them to some other processor where you can add just delay or distortion or reverb or whatever it is just to the upper bass. Probably not going to happen if you're using a multiband compressor. The benefit is the setup time is a lot faster and easier than using a parallel compressed bass. Although... Once you've parallel compressed bass a few times, it doesn't take long at all. All right, that's the long and short of it when it comes to bass. The next big instrument that wants to be compressed the most in any mix is going to be vocals. And the more produced or the more electronic your mix is, the more heavily compressed the vocals are going to need to be. If you're doing a fairly kind of organic, not heavily compressed rock or pop or folk mix, then maybe you don't need tons of vocal compression. And you can take one of our more minimalist approaches. But if you're working in a genre like electronic, EDM, hip hop, or just modern heavy rock and metal, those vocals often want to be compressed a lot to keep up with the significant amounts of dynamic control on other elements in the mix. And when you want to compress vocals a lot, you got to use some tricks. Fortunately, a lot of the things we just talked about on bass, ironically enough, apply to vocals too, just with some slightly different twists. So minimalist approach to compressing vocals. You could use slower attack, averaging compressors on vocals. And I find this to be a slightly more old school sounding approach, something like an LA-2A compressor on vocals can totally work. If you're using a ton of compression, maybe some of those particular old school compressors, you can start to hear them a little bit. And that's something we go into in length in the course is starting to hear some of those differences. But generally speaking, if you don't need to do a lot of compression, something like that, an averaging compressor that's really just controlling the averages, that can really work. But a more modern approach to compressing vocals if you're to use just one compressor, often things like faster attack compressors that might be more in the range of a millisecond or two attack time. And that often just gives a a slightly more modern feel to my ear. But when you need to apply significant amounts of compression, usually one compressor isn't going to do it. And you've probably heard this advice before of, oh, it's if you're going to do a lot of compression, it's better to have a couple of compressors or a few compressors, each doing a dB or two instead of one compressor trying to do all the compression itself. And usually if you're trying to get one compressor to do all that compression, you're going to hear it more and it's not going to work as well as splitting it up across multiple compressors. The thing that people usually leave out of this advice is 
why? And there's a good why to this. And I think you got to know the answer to why to really do it right, really do it effectively. So let's talk real quick about the problem of too much compression with a slow attack compressor and too much compression with a fast attack compressor. If you have a fast attack compressor on vocals, which means you're really trimming the transients, really smoothing them out a lot with your fast attack compressor, the potential side effect there is you start to lose some intelligibility. You start to lose some articulation and clarity and detail by doing a lot of fast attack compression. The problem with doing a lot of slow attack compression on a vocal, where you're letting all the transients through and you're not really compressing them much at all, is that when you're compressing with a slow attack compressor, you're not compressing things, particularly like S's and T's. Your consonants are getting through that compressor. And things like S's and T's in particular will really poke out, and you won't get the kind of dynamic control that you want, and you also hear some of this artifacting of using too much slow attack compression. So, even when we're doing this approach number one of kind of minimalist compression on vocals, using at least two compressors is generally a good strategy. One that has a fast attack and one that has a slow attack. This is how to use serial compression, stacking compressors right and effectively. Because if you're just applying two slow attack compressors, one after the other, you're not really getting the benefits of using two different compressors. You're just getting more and more of that main side effect of a slow attack compressor. Same thing with using two fast attack compressors in a row. You're not really getting the benefit of using two different compressors. It's only when you combine them and use complementary settings on the two compressors that you really get the benefits of using two or more compressors. A classic example of this is something like a fast attack 1176 compressor that's kind of catching the peaks on the vocal into a slightly slower attack, more averaging compressor like an LA-2A that's compressing the average. Those would be the old school recommendations for this kind of technique. You can do this kind of technique with so many other types of compressors, and we go into so many other types of compressors in the course, but I just want to throw that idea out there at you. Another type of compressor that you may use instead of or in addition to the fast attack compressor is a de which is a frequency-dependent compressor that's really focusing with a fast attack, mostly on things like S's and T's. But this is not the only way to compress a vocal. Our second big way to compress vocals is just like we talked about with drums and bass. Guess what it's going to be? It's parallel compression, except you take a very different approach with parallel compression on vocals. One thing remains the same. When you parallel compress vocals, you're generally going to be using really fast attack times to get a lot of dynamic control. Now, one of the side effects, one of the drawbacks of using those really fast attack times is we start to lose intelligibility and detail. But guess what we can do now to this really heavily compressed parallel vocal track? Make it really bright and bring back a lot of the detail that way. I'm talking about taking loads of low frequency out of your parallel compressed vocal and potentially boosting significant amounts of high frequency in your parallel compressed vocal. And the cool thing here is you can boost a lot of high and high mid frequencies without bringing out too many S's and T's because you used a super fast attack compressor to compress that vocal. And now all the S's and T's are already smoothed out significantly. So when you're adding a lot of brightness to the vocal, you're not just bringing up the S's and T's more, you're bringing up the clarity and intelligibility of everything. So you almost have this separate fader for vocal brightness, and it's controlled vocal brightness. So it's an absolutely beautiful technique. If you get too much brightness out of this approach, too much sizzle, too much air, then you can roll off some of the extreme highs. So sometimes you're not just rolling off all the lows, but you're also rolling off some of the extreme highs as well. If you want something that's a little bit more mid-rangey and gritty and earthy and aggressive, you could roll off, instead of just the super highs, you could roll off more and more of those highs until you almost get like a telephone effect or close to it in your parallel compressed track. So you could bring that up so it can be kind of like a vocal edge sound or a vocal body sound or a vocal grit sound, depending on how you EQ it. And we go into and hear some EQing strategies together in the course. All right, that's vocals.
Let's just go through a couple more here. I know we've gotten through like a full podcast length already, but I still want to give you just a couple more here. Let's talk about compressing guitars, pianos, and mix bus. And I'll try to make this super fast. So compressing guitars. Acoustic guitars in particular are another one of those instruments that want to be compressed in practically every mix. And usually, most of the time, you're probably going to err towards slightly faster attack compressors on acoustic guitars. Because one of the things that will often happen with dry recorded acoustic guitars, particularly if you're in like a bedroom or home studio environment in a small room, is that guitar will sound really close, really dry. And adding reverb to that acoustic guitar isn't always the right approach. But a way to make an acoustic guitar that's really bright and shimmery just set back a little further in the mix so it's not so much glued to the front of the speaker is to use a little bit of fast attack compression to swallow up some of those transients a little bit, to just soften the edge of the initial attack and strum on the acoustic guitar. So more often than not, faster attack compressors on acoustic guitars to give them some glue, definitely to give them some more dynamic consistency, and maybe to set them back a hair if they're leaping too far forward, which is a problem that I hear with acoustic guitars in a lot of beginning and amateur mixes. Now, this is not the only way to compress acoustic guitars. There are times where you're going to find a slower attack, more averaging focused compressor is going to work wonders on your acoustic guitar. And that is particularly the case on acoustic guitars, maybe that are a little bit dull and want to be brightened up a little bit or brought forward a little bit more. That's a principle we go into the course a lot, this whole idea of fast attack compressors setting things further back in the mix and slow attack compressors bringing them forward. We go through a lot of listening exercises so you can start to learn to hear that kind of thing for yourself. But more on that later. So acoustic guitar compression, that's your minimalist approach. Often faster attacks, sometimes slower attacks, depending on what it needs. I hope I gave you some ideas about how to think through that here. If you want to apply a lot of compression to acoustic guitars, and there's some context where that's appropriate, sometimes stacking compressors, one of each, can work. But I would say that things like parallel compression, often a little bit less necessary on things like acoustic guitar. Same with multiband compression. I find that the, the simple approaches of just picking the right compressor for the sound and properly EQing the guitar is often enough. It can be a lot of fun to play around with different models of old school vintage compressors on acoustic guitars because they'll often sound very distinctively different from one another on acoustic guitar. We do a lot of listening exercises on that in the, the full length course, but this is something you can play around with yourself. Try every different type of compressor you have on an acoustic and try to develop a sense memory for them on your own. If you do the listening exercises to develop a sensitivity for this kind of thing, you might end up finding that on the same guitar, one compressor has more of a beatles -y sound quality. One has more of a Cat Stevens-y sound quality. One has more of a Rick Rubin does Johnny Cash sound quality. And one has more of a modern country sound quality. So these are definitely things to play around with. Electric guitars are a little bit different. They often need a lot less compression on acoustic guitars. But clean electric guitars and electric guitar solos, particularly cleaner electric guitar solos, can definitely make use of compression. And some of the same principles apply. And we go into a lot of detail on that in the course as well. But I think that's a good starting point just to recognize that heavily distorted guitars are already compressed just by the nature of being distorted. But definitely look at your clean guitars and your guitar solos, even slightly distorted ones, as potential places to apply compression. All right, I want to get through keyboards and synths real quick. Let's talk about pianos in basic. Pianos are going to be often very lightly compressed in sparse sections where you have a featured piano, but in dense mixes where there's a lot of stuff going on, pianos often need to be compressed significantly and often EQ'd significantly too. And one of the best ways to do this is parallel compression on piano. When you're doing the minimalist approach on piano, a lot of the same things we've talked about, about the difference between fast attack compression and slow attack compression still applies. But when you're compressing heavily, it can be a great idea to split your track and get a really heavily compressed, really bright parallel piano track. And this is a track that you can fold into your dense 
sections that have a lot of elements going on. We really need the piano to sit at a stable level and get some clarity and some ability to cut through the mix. The cool thing about this approach is you can just automate that fader down when you return to a more sparse section that's supposed to have more of a natural, untouched piano. That's a cool trick. I'm probably giving away too many great free tricks in this free podcast episode. So if the free stuff is this good, imagine how good the stuff in the course is. Check out Compression Breakthroughs, another shameless plug. But all right, let's go a little further. Mix and master bus. Oh man, I have whole podcast episodes about this. There's a whole module about this in the course. Uh, there's so much to go into on compressing mix bus and in mastering. I got to tell you, I think we've gone long enough on this episode as it is. All that I will tell you for right now is that there are so many different ways to compress your mix bus. One common theme that often makes sense for mix bus compression is using a side chain as part of your mix bus compressor so that your compressor is not only responding to things like kick drum and bass that take up the most energy, low frequency energy in the mix. So side chaining is often a good approach. But if your compressor is really only reacting to low frequencies, there's a chance it's telling you something about there being too much low frequency energy in your mix. So rather than just using the side chain to cure a problem of way too much sub energy, take that as a cue to just listen and double check your mixes against other mixes you like in your style, just to make sure you don't have way more sub energy and way more low frequency energy than a lot of your favorite records, because that's a common thing that has to be addressed in mastering. Usually you're going to use lower ratios when it comes to mix bus compression, but there are people who do heavy handed mix bus compression as much as you know, four to one ratio, and sometimes we'll do four dB or more compression on their mix bus. The only way to get that much compression on your mix bus to sound good is to mix into your compressor. And be aware that if you take your compressor off later on in the mix, it's probably going to fall apart a little bit. A much safer way to approach mix bus compression, particularly if you're starting out, is with lower ratios. One and a half to one, two to one. Things like that, where you're aiming just to get a dB or 2 dB of compression in the loudest sections of your mix. If you're just starting out with using mix bus compression, that's the best way to go. And for a lot of people, it's the only way to go, no matter how experienced they get. But there are people working out there today who get great sounding mixes, who use way more compression than you're supposed to on your mix bus. Don't tell anyone I told you that. If anyone asks, it wasn't for me. It was one of the other channels. But yeah, that's a reality. And to learn how to do that well, if that's appropriate for the genre you're working in, and even knowing if it's appropriate for the genre you're working in, that's going to take a lot longer. So I think for today, let's cut it off here. I mean, I could talk about compression for 10 hours, and I do in the full length course, compression breakthroughs, and we also get to hear this stuff together. But more importantly, we get to learn together in that course the principles and the concepts that apply in every single genre on every single instrument. And even more centrally than that, you'll also finally learn how to hear this stuff because there are ways to really learn how to hear the subtlety of every single control on your compressor. Things we haven't talked about much today, like the knee of your compressor. We haven't really talked about the ratio or the threshold or how to set those very much. But just starting with the attack and release is a great thing to learn the sound of independently. But this is really hard to do unless you take really focused, deliberate methods that give you listening exercises so you can start to differentiate every single one of these parameter changes without being led astray by the fact that every time you change one parameter, you get a different amount of compression and you get a different final volume level out of your compressor that's going to totally skew your listening results. Only when you start to really control each one of these variables in isolation so that you can compare all of them so that you're getting the same amount of compression each time at the same level every time, can you really start to do listening exercises that are going to take you forward years in your learning curve on compression all at once? By doing the right compression listening exercises, you can literally shave years off of your learning curve. It takes so many of us years, three years, four years, five years, six years to really hear and get confident with compression. 
And these are not just numbers that I'm pulling out of my backside. Some of the best producers, engineers, and mixers working today have told me that's exactly what they went through and exactly how long it took them. But it doesn't have to take that long. Because once you really learn how to listen to compression properly, it starts to come together fast. And once you really understand on a conceptual level how to set these things and why, and how to hear the changes that you're making, only then will all the stuff that I just told you actually make sense and actually be useful for you. I just gave you all the quick cheat sheet to you know best practices for compressing each instrument. But that is nowhere near as important as getting your ear together and getting the right conceptual framework together in your head. And for that, man, check out the course Compression Breakthroughs if you really want to go deep over at CompressionBreakthroughs.com. It's not just me talking. We're going to hear and get ears on a lot of stuff together. And I think it's going to change the way that you hear and use compression forever. If you're not ready for it, I hope that this was useful to you. If you really feel like you can already hear compression and really have good confidence about setting it and hearing every last parameter change you're making, then maybe this free podcast episode was useful enough for you. And if so, great. But if you need more, that resource of compression breakthroughs is out there for you too. Well, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Is there anything big you think I left out? There's a lot that I left out. Man, like I said, I could talk about this for 10 or more hours. But if there's any specific tip or trick you want to throw into the comments down below, definitely let us know. I'd love to hear it. If you've taken compression breakthroughs, I absolutely want to hear from you too. Let us know in the comments down below how it's treating you. At the time I'm recording this, it's been out for less than a week, but hundreds upon hundreds of people have bought it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing your feedback on how has it been treating you so far. I know it's going to take a lot of you weeks to get through this thing, and it's the kind of course that you can revisit again and again for a lifetime, so I don't expect every single person to bought this to put testimonials down there about it now, but we'd love to hear about your experience just with using compression in general, compressing each of these instruments we talked about, and the course. Big shout out and thanks to you for making it this far in the episode. Big shout out and thanks to our sponsors on this episode. Key One being you. Again, you want to sponsor the podcast. Best way to do it if you've been enjoying it is check out one of our full-length courses like Compression Breakthroughs, Mixing Breakthroughs, or Mastering Demystified. Big shout out and thanks also to Isotope sponsoring the podcast this spring. And they have a special offer for you guys. Go over to isotope.com slash sonicscoop. That's isotope.com slash sonicscoop. And use the discount code sonicscoop10 to get 10% off of anything that they make. Or you can use it to get a 30-day free trial to their subscription bundle instead of just a seven-day free trial. Also, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for 30 days totally for free over at soundtoys.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. See you next time.